So welcome everybody to one of our seminars here in CFT. Today we have the pleasure of having Diana. Diana is going to present her work there from the Queen's University Belfast about objectivity. So Diana, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for and, having me. And uh, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you. So I'll first share my screen and uh, I'll ask you to confirm that you can see the presentation. Yes, we can, we can, perfectly. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, the title of the presentation is uh, Distinguishing Between Redundancy and Consensus When Quantifying Quantum Objectivity. And uh, before I start, I, I have to apologize because I actually have a very bad cough. So if I suddenly start coughing during the presentation, um, yeah, sorry, my bad. Um, anyway, uh, so what is going to be the outline of the presentation? I'm first just going to make um, an introduction on uh, what is quantum objectivity and what it means for us. And then I'm going to go a little bit deeper into the two main frameworks that are usually used in this context. One is quantum Darwinism and the other one is spectrum of the structure. And then I'm going to introduce these two quantifiers that have been um, well, introduced by us. They are redundancy and consensus. I'm going to tell you what they mean, what they quantify, and what are their connections with uh, quantum Darwinism and spectrum worker structure in particular. Um, and then just as a final slide, I'm just going to use them to highlight the importance of using uh, the average mutual information when quantifying quantum objectivity in the framework of quantum Darwinism. Uh, and uh, um, before we start, I'm just going to say that this was mostly a joint work with um, Luca Innocenti and Massimo Palma, both from the University of Palermo. So um, what is quantum objectivity? Now, of course, it's difficult to define objectivity even in a classical context. So what we usually do in the quantum context is that we make an operative definition and we go by it. Um, you can find lots of very slightly different definitions out there. Uh, just for the sake of um, you know, having a common one, we can, we, we can use this one, for example, from Odorakti in the uh, 2015 paper which simply says that a state of the system S exists objectively if many observers can find out the state of S independently. So the idea uh, is that- Pardon, yeah. I, I beg you, I beg you pardon to be an <laughs> annoying audience already from the first slide, but I just wanted to rectify uh, one thing here. It's not our definition. We took it from okay. Wojtek's, uh, from Wojtek's paper, which is uh, I ah, think yes, 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 yes. Nature Physics 2009. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, he he wrote it, but he did not work much with it because he moved on to to entropic quantities. Mm -hmm. uh, but just just not to make a false impression that we have invented it, we have not. We no, 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 yeah, it okay. almost literally yes, yes, yes. from uh, Wojtek Zurek's paper. That, yeah, that yeah, was okay. just one remark. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, sorry. Okay. So perhaps he was slightly misleading the way I introduced it. Um, so you can find. Uh, so you can find this same definition in many different papers, basically. And every single time is worded slightly differently. This is simply why I wanted to take one and put it here, uh, just so we, we, we literally are looking at the same words. Uh, but yes, thank you for the clarification. Um, so, okay, this is simply what uh, we're going to use. And so the, the, the whole idea uh, is that if um, several observers are able to perform uh, certain types of measurements that allow them to infer information about the system S, and then that information is consistent. It means that they can uh, you know, share the outcomes of the result, for example, among themselves and agree about it. Then we can say that whatever property they have measured about S is an objective property. So, okay, um, just to have a very quick uh, feeling of how this looks in the quantum context, um, just suppose that you have a system S uh, the system S is surrounded by an environment, and we already uh, make the assumption that the environment is divided into several sub-environments. And then the system interacts with the sub-environments, it undergoes the coherence, there is information flow from the system into the sub-environments. And this means that, in principle, each sub-environment contains some information about the system. And then if we have several observers, and let's say that each observer has access to one of the sub-environments and they're able to perform measurements and try to infer information about the system. And if the information they infer is consistent, if they all get the same outcome, let's say, 
then we can say that whatever they measured about S, whatever information they inferred is, is objective. Um, so how does this work in, uh, so as I said, there's, there's two main frameworks and some variations of this two. One of the most famous ones is quantum Darwinism. And how do you, in quantum Darwinism, measure whether a system is, is objective or not? So what you usually do is that you use a quantifier, which is the quantum mutual information between the system, and an environmental fraction of size f. So f in this case is a number going from zero to one, which simply tells you how big your fraction is. So okay, the mutual information is defined as um, the entropy of the system plus the entropy of the fraction minus the joint entropy of system and fraction. And if you were to compute this quantity and then plot it as a function of f, so as, as a function of how big the, this, the, 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 the environmental fraction is, if you are dealing with an objective state, you would probably get a plot that looks like this. Um, so what is the, let's say, the interpretation you would make of a plot that looks like this? Basically, you have that the mutual information increases very fast as f increases. Um, and then you reach a point, a certain value of f that we call f of zero, for which uh, the mutual information is exactly equal the entropy of the system. And now, in principle, if the mutual information is equal to the entropy of the system, it means that whatever ignorance you have on the system can be recovered by measuring the environmental fraction. And therefore, if you only need a tiny portion of the environment to obtain information about the system, in principle, you could cut your environment into many fractions, each fraction being of the size f of zero. And therefore, you would have one over f of zero of environmental fractions that contain sufficient information about the system. So the, the condition you're looking for is that you usually are looking for, for the uh, f of zero value for which this condition is satisfied. And then this implies that more or less one over f of zero observers are able to agree about the state of, well, about some property of the system. Uh, and just for reference, this is what a non-objective state usually looks like. Uh, of course, both cases are assuming that the overall system and environmental state are is pure. Um, and in this case, you simply have that emission information doesn't increase fast at all. And the only way for you to have emission information which is higher than the entropy of the system is to have um, an environmental fraction bigger than one half. And if the fraction is bigger than one half, this means that at most you can have only one fraction that contains sufficient information about the system. And then of course you cannot have consensus between observers be because only one person is able to, to, to have that information. So, okay, this is the overall, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going quite quick here because I assume all of this stuff is known by many of you, but obviously if I'm going too fast or if there's doubts, just stop me. Um, so this, um, is, is just the overall idea of quantum Darwinism. However, you could ask yourself your question of what can the observers actually measure and see and uh, what kind of agreement they can have among themselves. Um, so one way to see it is that obviously the, you can perform measurements on both the system and your environmental fraction. Um, and if you perform those measurements, you're going to have probability outcomes. So probability outcome for uh, the system, probability outcomes from the measurement performed on the environmental fraction, and then the joint one. And from these probability outcomes, which are now just classical probability distributions and nothing else, what you can do is that you can compute a, a mutual information, which is not quantum anymore, uh, because again, it's with classical distributions. Sorry. Um, and this is this has the same form, like let's say the same form of the quantum mutual information, simply that now the uh, von Neumann entropy is um, like you, you have the Shannon entropy instead. Uh, and of course, this quantity heavily depends. <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I did warn you about the cough. Um, uh, so this quantity heavily depends on uh, which measurements you're specifically performing on the measure on, on the system and on the environmental fraction. Um, but of course, what you can do is that you can max you can maximize over the measurements that you perform, and this way you create a quantity which we call accessible information. So the accessible information is the highest, well, it's, it's, yeah, it's the, the maximized degree of correlations that you can have between measurements performed on the system and measurements performed on the environmental fraction, and it effectively represents 
um, correlations that the observers can see by performing measurements on their local sub-environments. Um, and obviously one thing that is very well known is the fact that um, there's a like the numer numerical difference between the quantum mutual information and the accessible information is a quantity called discord. And discord is usually different than zero for many states. Um, and this implies that if you try and use the uh, quantum mutual information as a quantifier of objectivity, you may uh, have to deal with, let's say, false positives in the sense that uh, the quantum mutual information may tell you that there's objectivity, but once you actually go and compute the accessible quantity, um, that objectivity may not be there because you were fooled by the fact that there was a certain amount of discord. Okay, so this creates some sort of accessibility issue, let's say. So the fact that not all of the information encoded in and uh, there has also been some solutions that try to deal with this problem. One, it's the strong quantum Darwinism. Now, the idea is very simple. The, the whole framework is exactly the same one as quantum Darwinism. And the only thing that you do is that instead of using the quantum mutual information, you use the accessible information as a quantifier. And then you're still looking for the same condition. So, so you're still searching for um, the f of zero value. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> so you're looking for the f of zero value such that the accessible information is the entropy of the system. Um, and then of course, one of that f of zero will be <clears throat> the um, number of observers that can agree. And then there's the um, second approach, which is spect spectrum worker structure, um, which basically, um, so the idea is quite different. It's more of a geometric idea. Um, and it basically just tells you that uh, the system is objective if the overall system and environment state has this specific form, which is called the SBS form. Uh, so the important thing to notice here is that, well, there's a couple of things to notice that are interesting. One is that this state is a uh, classical quantum by definition, which means that it's a, z a zero discord state. Um, and on the other hand, the other, like the, the important condition here is that different Rij um, are orthogonal to one another uh, <coughs> and therefore uh, easy to distinguish. So just as an example here, you have um, that if the state, if the system is in the zero state, then you have uh, the environmental subsystems, which are R00, R01, R02. And then the R00 is orthogonal to R10, which means that the state of the sub-environment conditioned by different states of the systems are orthogonal to one another. So what you can do is that you simply measure your sub-environment, they're orthogonal to one another, so they're distinguishable, and therefore you automatically know what is the state of the system. And one quantifier usually used in this context then is just the fidelity between the state you actually have and the closest state that is an SPS state. If your state has a high fidelity to an SPS one, then you claim that your state is objective. So this was just, yeah. Sorry for disturbing you. Uh, so both cases, uh, uh, you don't consider this code is as uh, information of a system or something. <laughs> uh, this code is, because I'm not that familiar with this code, but uh, in both so, cases, uh, we uh, we don't consider this, this code as uh, information. Yes, so the thing about this code is that uh, you can see Discord as correlations that are not locally accessible. Uh, and this is the issue in the context of objectivity. Because um, basically the idea is that if there is discord between the system and environment, there is no way you can access that correlation by making local measurements on your system and then local measurements of your environment. However, this is exactly the kind of framework you're working in. We are working in the context of objectivity because you want to infer information about the system, but you don't want to measure the system directly, okay? So you don't want to make, for example, non-local measurements between system and environment. Um, and this is why we are simply not interested in Discord in the sense that um, it, it's not something that it's useful in the specific context of quantum objectivity. Uh, does, does that make sense? Does that answer yeah, the question? thank you very much, yeah. Um, so um, this was just a very quick overview. Um, 
And then, oh yeah, there's one final point. Uh, it's basically the fact that there's an established hierarchy between SPS and quantum Darwinism. So SPS is uh, considered to be more stringent in the sense that if a state fulfills this condition, then it will automatically fulfill the condition of uh, quantum Darwinism. However, the opposite is not true. So if you have a system that um, fulfills the condition of quantum Darwinism, you need extra conditions to ensure that that state is also SPS. Um, you can find the details in this reference here where they exactly prove this. Um, so now let's move to uh, what, are, what is redundancy, what is consensus, and uh, what do they mean and how we define them. Um, so the idea was to have two different quantifiers. So both redundancy and consensus for us, they are quantities. Um, and we wanted them to reflect their, let's say, intuitive meaning in English language, okay? So I'll start with redundancy, which simply answers the question of um, how many times information about the system is encoded into the environment. And then we have consensus, which answers the question of how many observers can simultaneously extract information about the system. Okay. Now, these two questions may look extremely similar. And as a matter of fact, there's uh, many, many different cases where redundancy and consensus, they're exactly the same. Um, because uh, how many times you, you encode information into the environment is also how many times you can extract it. Uh, however, we will see later that there are some cases where this is not true. Um, and so you, you do have a numerical difference be between redundancy and consensus. Okay. Now, um, the way they are defined uh, in, in an operative manner, so redundancy, the idea is um, if you can create a, a partition of the environment. So you partition the environment into n sub-environments such that the accessible information between the system and each sub-environment is the entropy of the system. Um, if you have created your partition in such a way that n is the largest number that allows you to do so, then n is also exactly the redundancy of your system. Okay, so it's a, a, precisely the highest number of um, fractions into which you can partition your environment, ensuring that each fraction is uh, fully correlated with the system. Consensus is a bit more convoluted. Um, so first you would need to define this quantity P of rho n. Uh, so P of rho n is the probability that given that you take a completely random partition of the environment, and this is a crucial point, so you, you don't engineer your partition, you don't try and create the best partition, you just take a random one. Uh, given your random partition, what is the probability that the accessible information between the system and the environmental fraction is exactly the entropy of the system uh, for each fraction, okay? And this is this, this probability, this P of rho n, and the consensus is then the largest n, such as this probability is more or less one, okay? Um, so the, the, the crucial difference here is that this partition is, let's say, it's an optimal one. And in this case, you just take a random one. Uh, so what is one case for which, but not the only one, where you can have a numerical difference between redundancy and consensus? So usually it's whenever you have to deal with information that it's encoded fragilely into the environment. Okay, so one, let's say, easy example is um, if, for example, so let's assume that these are qubits just for simplicity. Um, and let's then assume that uh, the information about the system is not encoded into the qubits individually, but it's encoded into co the correlations that the qubit have among themselves. And then this means that if you measure um, the correct pair, let's say of qubits, you can effectively see what is the state of the system. Um, but even if you measure a relatively large fraction of the environment, but you're not actually measuring a pair, so a complete pair, then you're still left completely ignorant about the state of the system. Um, and so continuing with this analogy, again, uh, this is uh, the situation where the information is encoded into the pairs of qubits. If you want to compute redundancy and you have a situation like this, then of course, you, all you need to do is that you need to um, partition the, the environment into individual pairs. Every pair has information about the system. And so in this case, you would have redundancy, which is six. Uh, however, with consensus, you don't assume, so 
the, the idea behind consensus is that you don't want to assume that you know something about the structure of the correlation about the environment. You just have a bunch of qubits and you just divide them to a bunch of observers, like you just distribute it to a bunch of observers and you don't have any prior information that can help you into creating the optimal partition. So what you can do is just you just sample them randomly. And as you can see, we have some uh, partitions which effectively contain a pair and therefore it will contain sufficient information about the system, uh, but others will not. And then of course, consensus will be strictly less than redundancy. Um, so there's also a connection that you can create, uh, well, you can establish between redundancy consensus and then SPS and um, quantum Darwinism. Uh, so the redundancy one is again, the, the the more simple, let's say, compared to consensus. Um, if you have a state which is SPS and therefore it has this structure, uh, and then you have this N, which is the largest N possible that still allows you to retain an SPS structure, then this N value is precisely the redundancy, okay? So it's exactly the highest number of fractions um, that into which you can divide the environment, ensuring that each fraction is still fully correlated with the system. Um, and with consensus, on the other hand, if you compute this quantity, uh, and notice that there's a tilde here, so this is the, again, accessible information within the system and the environmental fraction um, of size f of zero, and you're um, having that, this condition, so this is equal to the entropy of the system. However, uh, the tilde here means that this accessible information is averaged between all the um, environmental fractions of the same size. Okay, and this is a crucial point. Anyway, um, if this condition is met, which obviously looks a lot like uh, the condition you're looking for in quantum Darwinism, then one over f of zero is the consensus of your system. And again, I stress the fact that there's an important, um, let's say detail that you're adding compared to uh, standard quantum Darwinism, which is the fact that this is the average between all fractions of the same size. Okay, but the, one of the main points here is that um, you can use the framework of SBS to measure the redundancy, and you can use the framework of quantum Darwinism to measure the consensus. Excuse um, me. Yeah. Question: Can we can we return two slides? Two backwards? slides. Uh, here. It, oh, here, here. The, yeah. Uh, do I understand correctly that? different observers uh, see different partition, pieces of partition. Can uh, observer be associated with this piece of partition? Yeah, yeah, uh, I would say different observers see different partitions. Yeah, yeah okay, but then uh, when you're talking about um, consensus, mm -hmm. the observers don't don't understand that they are, they are uh, take, making measure on absolutely different pieces. The I mean, look different. How uh, they cannot distinguish, you know, one is saying, listen, I, I measuring this and you measuring different. So what kind of context? Or they cannot so distinguish. The idea is that, uh, now, of course, you see things with a certain special structure, but that may not be the case whenever uh, you, you, you're looking into other contexts. So the, the idea is that, um, so you have your environment and your environment has a bunch of constituents. And uh, since you don't know, um, so in principle, you don't know um, what is the structure of the correlations within the environment. And so you don't know how this environment sh should be uh, partitioned into the optimal manner. Okay, so this no, is I what the observers don't know. So I they don't know. But, but look, if one observer observed like two, uh, circles and another observes three circles. They cannot distinguish. They cannot say a priori that we are looking for different systems. Uh, different systems. I understand uh, if they all uh, all are three. I understand, but if okay, one is okay, three, okay, okay, yes, yes, yes. Okay, so it, you're you're complaining basically about the the two here. So um, the the one of some like we do actually. So let's say that this image is slightly misleading in the sense that yes, we do make the assumption. Uh, that even in the context of consensus, the observers measure environmental fractions of, of the same size. Okay, so you're given, let's say, again, if you're talking about qubits, you're given the exactly same number of qubits to every observer. 
Uh, and I apologize if this uh, image okay. maybe was slightly misleading because there's two, okay. Now, in principle, this assumption can be relaxed because again, in principle, um, all you want is that your fraction allows you to infer information about the system. And in principle, there's nothing that stops you from having smaller fractions and larger fractions. Um, but this is something that we didn't do simply for, on the one hand, simplicity, and on the other hand, the possibility to uh, create connections with previous results in literature. Um, but yeah, let's say it's maybe a matter of um, opinion. Uh, but yes, so what we actually do is that we assume that every fraction has the same size anyway. Okay. Do you know, uh, can I also interrupt you? In yeah, yeah, sure. Question? So what is the relation now between redundancy and consensus? If one is zero, for instance, is the other one also zero or vice versa? How does it work? Uh, so there was, uh, I, I, I'm actually going to delve into this now, so. Oh, okay, okay, so please continue. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so, okay, um, so first thing, I just wanted to make an example. Um, actually, there's going to be two examples. So. Um, this is an example of one specific uh, system and environmental structure that allows you to have a numerical difference between the redundancy and consensus. So, okay, the whole thing is we have these two quantifiers, they're numerical quantifiers. Uh, in many cases, uh, let's say in the simplest cases you can consider, they're usually the exact same quantity. Um, however, in other less trivial cases, they can be numerically different. And this is one case that I will highlight where there can be a numerical difference between the two. Um, and this is whenever you have, uh, so in, in this specific example, you have that the information is encoded into GZ states. Okay, so you have that if the system is in zero, then the environment is in a product state of many GZ plus states. And if the system is in one, then the environment is um, in a product of many GZ minus states. So GZ minus and plus and minus, they're simply like the standard GZ where you have a plus or a minus be like between zero and one. Um, and the interesting thing is that the GZ plus and GZ minus, they're perfectly distinguishable only as long as you measure all the qubits to get, well, not together, but like only as long as you measure all the qubits. If you lose access to even one qubit, then the two states are, they, they will look exactly the same. Okay. Um, so this is, so again, this is like an example of this fragile encoded information in the sense that you need to be able to measure all of the GZ states. Um, like you need to be able to have all of the, all of the qubits making up the GZ state in your fraction. Otherwise you will not be able to recover the information. Uh, and this is just a little diagram. Uh, this is uh, here, I'm talking about the quantum mission information and then the plot will be the accessible one. So I'm sorry if this is a bit misleading. Um, so what you usually have, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> so <clears throat> what you usually have is that, well, not usually, but what you have in this case is that if you're able to measure all of the qubits making up a single GZ state, then um, your mutual information will be the entropy of the system. If you're able to measure one qubit from each of the GZ states. So you have like your, your environments in a product state of many GZs. If you measure one qubit from each of those, the entropy of your system, they are like the, the mission information will be again the entropy of your system. If both conditions are met, so if you're measuring both a, a full GZ state and each, a single qubit from each one, then uh, your mission information will be um, two times the entropy of the system. And if neither conditions are met, then your mission information will be zero. Now, this is only useful in the sense that um, it allows you to create conditions. And uh, for each condition, you know what is the what is the mission information. And then the whole game of computing the quantum mission information just becomes a combinatorial game. Um, and if you wanted to, well, actually uh, plot the mission information, this is what you would get. Um, so here you have, in this case, it's, it's the accessible information. So the, 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 the largest value, it's, it's up to one. Um, and here you have accessible information averaged as a function of the, of the environmental fraction. 
uh, in three cases, in, win, in, which, in one case we have uh, redundancy 40, in another case it's 160, and in another one it's uh, more than 1,000. So a detail I should maybe highlight is in this case, precisely because each GZ state, it's like each GZ plus and minus are orthogonal to one another, therefore they're distinguishable, and therefore n, this number here, is exactly the redundancy. So it's, it's exactly how many times the information has been written into the uh, environment. And so this is the redundancy, and from this plot, you can compute the consensus as one over f of zero. And then you can see that whenever redundancy is 40, for example, consensus is one. So basically, there's no objectivity. Um, and you need very, very high values of redundancy to have relatively small values of consensus. So with consensus four, you could, in principle, claim that this is an objective state because four people are already agreeing among themselves but you only have that because you have encoded information more than a thousand times into the environment. So obviously this is a very strong example in the sense that here you have information that is encoded in an extremely fragile way, and therefore it's extremely difficult to extract it. Um, but as you can see, um, so th this basically shows you that there's a very, very large difference between consensus and redundancy. Um, so second, I mean, this redundancy, when the redundancy is 40, the consensus mm -hmm. is one. Yes. And when, when we actually reduce the redundancy like by half 20, what happened mm -hmm. to the consensus? Uh, it will still be one. So one means that uh, only one person can have information about the system. Um, if redundancy is 20, so basically, as you can see, so 40 is this plot here, this blue line. Okay, so as you can see, uh, in order for me to reach the value of one of mutual information, I need um, an, an F value, which is more or less 0 0.6, okay? So if it's more or less 0 0.6, it means that only one person can, can have access to 60% of the environment, because then 40% will not be enough to give you enough information about the system. If redundancy would be 20, let's say, you would probably have a similar plot, but then maybe you would need, let's say, 70%, 80% for you to know enough about the system. So again, one person can have access to 80% of the environment, but obviously only one. Um, does that make sense? Uh, yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so let's say, <laughs> Uh, the way you compute consensus is literally you look, so provided your, your computed this quantity, you look at the necessary f such that, such that this quantity is one, and then you do one divided by f of zero. Um, but then, of course, you will get a number which is not an integer, uh, so you have to approximate, okay? Uh, so if, if 1.5 uh, let's say if, if, if 1.5 um, observers can agree on the system, well, that's actually one. Okay. Uh, so this is why um, so consensus needs to be uh, an integer number because it's the number of observers. Okay. So even Diana, if the number is you, lower. Diana, yeah. One, one question uh, just to make sure. So uh, that's the accessible information, not the quantum neutral, right? Yeah, in this plot is the accessible, yes. It's the accessible, and yeah. uh, it is average. So you take the fraction size, let's say 20%. Yes. You have quite a lot of these fractions, right? Because you have the mm -hmm. GZ state, and what yeah. is K in this case? Uh, how big is K? Uh, so K is uh, like the size of your GZ. Um, in this specific example, in this example is four. So every- okay, fantastic. So fantastic. Yeah. So you have uh, four to forty, so to say. So uh, forty-four yes. qubit systems, and yes. then you take you take a fraction of let's say twenty percent of yes. all of this huge number. Yes. You run a uh, uh, you run sort of a uh, numerical averaging. You take every partition of this size. You calculate mm -hmm. the accessible information somehow. So you have a way to uh, to maximize over the measurements, right? Yeah, so in this case, it's actually, so because the GZ state has a, let's say, simple structure in this case, um, you know okay. everything is, let's say, easy in the sense that you have a way to know the, um, you have a way of computing the accessible information in an easy manner, and then uh, you have a way of, so you don't actually work with the states, you just 
um, so you know, um, basically it's, 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 it's this sort of game I was talking about before, uh, but this is for the mutual quantum, but you can make a similar one for the accessible as well. Um, so you know that whenever certain conditions are met, you have a certain amount of um, accessible sure. information, sure, 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 and sure, then sure. it just you becomes have a, a lot yeah. of symmetry. You have a, you have a yeah. lot of sort of like symmetry here. Okay. Yes. But yes, most yes, important yes. is I, I I wanted to make sure that uh, the plot re represents the average. So yes. when I see the f the the fraction size. For each point on the uh, horizontal axis, this means that it has been average of all possible yes. fractions. Yes, 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 yes. Exactly. Okay. Thank you very much. So every point, every 0 0.4, for example, it's average between all the fractions that have that specific size. Yes. Um, so, um, so this is what happens. Uh, so this is the, the first example. Um, I will then make a second example, but I'll be quick because it doesn't really change that much. And it's the case where instead of encoding information is the, in the GZ state, you encode in W state. Uh, so again, you have W plus and W minus. Um, those two states, they are um, orthogonal to one another. Um, now, the, the only difference between W and GZ state is that the information is slightly less fragile in W states in the sense that for a GZ state, when you lose a qubit, you lose every information you have. You cannot distinguish it anymore. Uh, for the W state, Two W states are still slightly distinguishable from one another, even if you lose a qubit. Okay, uh, so what we expect is that this will um, ensure that it's easier to reach consensus for this state structure compared to the GZ state case. Uh, and this is what we have. So in this example, a K, so the number of qubits for each GZ state or W is three. Um, and here I'm actually plotting the, um, the, the quantum machine information, so this is not the accessible, uh, although it doesn't really change that much. So it's obviously more appropriate to compute the, um, to, to, to compute the accessible because of all the uh, accessibility issues I mentioned, but in these specific cases, there isn't that, not that much of a big difference. Uh, but as you can see, it is easier to reach objective states you, you, you have a plateau for smaller f of zero whenever the information is encoded into W states instead of GZ states. Okay, so this is again just an example where you have um, a different encoding. Again, numerical difference between redundancy and consensus. Um, obviously, less fragile information means higher consensus. So, okay, um, wrapping things a little bit. Um, what uh, like both the definitions I mentioned and also the examples I have provided, they basically tell you that whenever there is an information encoding which is non-homogeneous, um, then redundancy will be higher than consensus. So redundancy is, let's say, the highest value consensus can have. Um, and whenever the information is uh, non-homogeneously encoded, consensus will usually be smaller. And of course, information being encoded into the correlations between um, the, the, the environmental constituents, this is an example of non-homogeneous information encoding. Uh, but then if redundancy is higher than consensus, usually, um, this also means that given that there's a connection between redundancy and consensus and SBS and quantum Darwinism, this means that the hierarchy I was talking, before, uh, I was talking about before it doesn't actually hold. Now, of course, this is all under a very big assumption, which I highlighted before and I highlighted again because it's crucial. And it's the fact that in this specific case, whatever I call quantum Darwinism, I mean quantum Darwinism as measured via the average accessible information. Okay. Because um, otherwise, if, if we're still talking about the, the, let's say, homogeneous information encoding, this, this, um, this hierarchy still holds. Um, and I think this is when, yeah. When we take a measurement to it for the system with the consensus one, it actually destroy information after uh, next measurement, after first measurement, or uh, if sorry, we have a large number of redundancy. Mm -hmm. But still, consensus is one, and when you take a measurement of uh, uh, on the environment, you destroy information after first measurement or can still <clears throat> so when I, when redundancy is high but consensus is one it means that 
I can in principle infer information about the system, but I need to measure most of the environment in order to do so. And of course, the idea is that usually, uh, I mean, usually in this context, the idea is that of course, um, you make your measurement on your environmental fraction and you do it only once, let's say after your environmental fraction has been measured, then of course it has been altered by your measurement and you cannot use it again to infer information about the system. Um, so th does, that, does that answer your question? Even if you have a higher redundancy than one, still, uh, you, uh, and if we have a, just simply one consensus, so you destroy information? Um, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, to be honest. Oh, so maybe, maybe, maybe let me rephrase it. Uh, when you look at the your first slide, <clears throat> I, mm -hmm. I don't remember how much of the definition you put on the first slide, but uh, objectivity, how it was defined by, by Jurek, they had basically two ingredients. One ingredient wa was agreement in some way consensus redundancy however you call it and the second the second ingredient was uh, non-disturbance yes okay. um so how sbs is constructed for example we uh, we try to satisfy satisfy both of them Mm -hmm. but uh, the non-disturbance is uh, satisfied only on average because uh, requiring non-disturbance uh, in a strict sense. So uh, basically after each measurement, your state is not altered. That would be of course uh, suicidal. I mean, that would be just basically zero state or one state that satisfies it. Mm -hmm. So in SBS, we have this uh, self-reproducing, so to say property that if you use the right measurements so the measurements which are which are uh, projecting on the uh, on the supports of the orthogonal states of the environment then when you when you make the average so sometimes it's called forgetting the results if you forget the results you will get the sbs state back mm -hmm. and this was uh, this is how we uh, how we interpreted uh, non disturbance and actually it, it has a deeper philosoph philosophical roots it goes to the uh, I, a, a pr bore discussion actually a pr bore argument Okay, and we took sort of a uh, board position, which was uh, uh, less stringent than, than Einstein. So mm -hmm. if you can reproduce on average the joint state, this, this means you have non-disturbance. As far as I understand, here you do not completely touch the, the non-disturbance. You, uh, you are just interested in, in the questions how much information is accessible, uh from which fraction yeah what yeah, happens yeah, is yeah. That what happens with the state afterwards it it, it it you do not care about it yeah 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 so this is correct um okay, at so the same it's time like it's pardon so it's it's in a sense it's it, it's a little bit like addressing the first part part of the definition of objectivity yes yeah. so, so you are you are dwelling very nicely actually i will have more comments later when you when you finish but you are dwelling in this structure world. What does this agreement really mean if you can have a non-trivial correlation structure within environment? Yes, 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 yes. So the, okay. this, this okay. is correct. Okay. Um, <laughs> at the same time, I will also highlight that um, because you can, in principle, um, refer, like there is this connection between redundancy and SBS, uh, so, of course, whatever non-disturbance you have in the SCBS framework, it can, it can in principle, be uh, transferred to, um, to, to, to the redundancy uh, measure. Although with consensus, I would need to be a bit more careful because, honestly, I, I, like, I would need to think about it because it's, it's slightly different. Um, anyway, um, yeah, so basically this was uh, pretty much the end of the discussion between uh, comparing redundancy and consensus, I will just I just have a final slide, which is the thing I mentioned before. Um, so here I want to simply um, show a slightly different model. Um, on the one hand, this is a different uh, context, well, a slightly different case where again you have numerical difference between redundancy and consensus, and it can tell you something about the well, what we call the importance of using the average measure information. 
So suppose you have a situation where um, some of the qubits are correlated with the system, um, perfectly correlated with the system, means that measuring a single one of them allows you to infer everything you need to know about the system, and hence why they have a happy face. Uh, and then you have other environmental qubits which are completely uncorrelated with the system. I'm actually sorry I didn't put the state formula because it would have been um, easier. Uh, in any case, um, so the idea is um, some of your environment is fully correlated, the rest of your environment is fully uncorrelated, and it will not tell you anything about the system. Uh, so you can do, for example, then in this case, the following. You can compute the quantum initial information, and then you can not average it. But because you're not averaging the initial information, because there's, you know, this, the environment is non-homogeneous, some qubits are correlated, some are not. When you compute, um, so basically this, whenever you compute the um, quantum emission information as a function of the fraction size, effectively what you need to do is that you need to choose a sequence of environmental fractions, okay, because you're not performing any average. And this is just a, a this is a trivial example, but you can already see that depending on how you choose your sequence, you can obtain very different mutual information plots. Um, so you can have case A, where the mutual information has a very tiny plateau at the beginning, and then it's two for most of the time. Case B, where the mutual information is pretty much zero for most of the time. And then case Z C, where you do have a plateau. However, you'll see that in a second, this plateau is also misleading because if you try to use it as a quantifier of objectivity, you would get misleading results. Um, and this is instead what happens when you um, compute the average mutual information. Um, in this specific case, for, five, for, for two different cases, one for redundancy five, so five qubits fully correlated, um, and then another one for redundancy 50, so 50 qubits fully correlated. Um, <coughs> And what you can see here, again, you have like this numerical difference. So again, if redundancy is five, consensus is one. And if redundancy is 50, consensus is 11 in this specific case. Um, so again, you have a, an, an example whenever you have like of, of the fact that there's a numerical difference. And in this case, we didn't have to invoke a non-local encoding of information. The information here is not fragilely encoded. It's simply non-homogeneous in the sense that only a portion of the environment has it. And then the other thing that's interesting to notice is that there's no way where you can create a um, mutual information plot which is not averaged, which will actually um, give you reliable information. Okay, because even the green uh, plot where you can see a plateau would um, fool you into heavily overestimated the value of consensus, and you would estimate a value which is actually higher than the redundancy itself. Okay, so you're effectively measure something, um, let's say, which is which is not consistent with the with the with with the, um, with with the state, basically. Okay, so this is um, yeah, this is basically just um, so two things. On the one hand, you don't need fragile encoding information; non-homogeneity is enough. And on the other hand, um, whenever information is encoded in a non-homogeneous way. Um, the results obtained by uh, mutual information, which is not averaged, is usually highly misleading and uh, um, or difficult to interpret. And the only way to get results which are self-consistent is to use the average one. Um, and this is pretty much the end of it. I leave you with the big fish we have in Belfast and thank you for the attention. Thank you very much for the presentation, Jenna. That was very, very nice. Uh, so now we have time for questions, at least uh, mm -hmm. eight minutes, seven minutes for questions. Well, we can have a bit more, of course. <laughs> okay, so uh, if I may, uh, I will start. So thank you very much, Diana. Very, very nice presentation. Um, uh, I, so as far as I understand the, uh, the difference between the uh, redundancy and consensus comes when you have correlations in the, in the environment, right? It doesn't have to be so correlations is definitely one case where you have the differences. Uh, it doesn't have to be correlations. It can be what I showed in the last slide. So it can only be 
an environment which is not which is not homogeneous which okay. is not oh, okay 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 also also can be non homogeneous okay but i wanted uh, uh, i wanted first of all i wanted to understand one thing that you uh, state in your paper in the quantum paper you say mm -hmm. that uh, sbs is uh, better in quantifying one thing and the uh, Jurex original condition is better in quantifying the other thing. So mm -hmm. uh, can you can you sort of explain that? I, I forgot which was which. Uh, so basically it's, um, you actually can see it, like I didn't go too much into details, but um, so in, in this slide, um, you can see that based on how we define redundancy and consensus, which they, they have their own, let's say, independent definitions, um, which are simply like operatively translating their meaning. Um, but when you make some relatively simple assumptions or simplifications, you can reconduct them. Um, you can re reconduct redundancy to SPS, and then you can reconduct consensus to, well, to quantum Darwinism. But again, the, the average, it's an important detail because otherwise it doesn't work. So I don't know if I would call this uh, Zurex original because he, a lot like he does consider to perform the average sometimes, but he doesn't uh, stresses uh, stresses it. He does. He does the average. He does the average. You have to dig. Uh, you have to dig uh, deep. It's not on the surface. It's usually yeah. some mentions in the captions to the figures. I, I think <laughs> they, they did not they did not seem it that it was uh, for them it did not seem to be so uh, so important yeah yeah uh, but yes 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 they, they do perform the average in, for, for sure in some papers um I, and yeah um so yeah so basically um this is just the, so this is the connection so basically if you want to use the sbs uh, framework uh, you can see that let's say this number of n would be redundancy assuming that it's maximized. And again, for consensus, this uh, basically consensus is pretty much the same definition of Zurek in the sense that he also defines it, defines it, uh, defines it as one over f of zero. Yeah, yeah but uh, okay. But uh, first of all, I, I think the, uh, it's not pretty same as Zurek because the problem, at least with the original Zurek's work, uh, mm -hmm. they were using quantum mutual information. Yes, that, that's another they were, thing. They were, yeah. they were sort to of say, as far as I understand, they were sort to of say trying to uh, surf or sail on on the uh, intuitions that one has with uh, uh, classical mutual information. The, mm -hmm. the the problem that we highlighted, uh, well, this is known problem, but but the 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 motivating point to to search for some other expression of quantum Darwinism than then the Jurex entropic was the quantum mutual information has very poor uh, operational meaning in this sense. Yes. That's this yes, yes. Uh, um, uh, asymptotic amount of randomness that you have to add to break state into its uh, partial traces, basically. So mm -hmm. it has it has very poor it has very poor uh, operational meaning here. While I think this should be stressed in your approach, you are using the accessible information, yes. whether it's easy yes, to yes. calculate or not. But at least it has a very good, solid uh, operational uh, operational meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, so do I understand that this suitability or not for calculating one thing or or the other comes more from how the redundancy and consensus definitions are phrased in your language? Because in principle, if you have SBS state, you can go on and calculate the, the accessible informations between different parts. Uh, so, I mean, for it's sure... It's also pretty easy because uh, if you have real SBS, so the strict SBS with the orthogonality of the supports, then, then of course, you will have a lot of zeros and you will have a lot of symmetries there. So, I think one... Uh, so, of course, you can always... Um... So the, 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 I think the important detail that doesn't make it so straightforward to go from SPS to consensus is precisely the average thing. Uh, so in principle, you could construct an SPS um, that works for uh, the average uh, environmental fractions. So let's say a, an upgraded version of SPS in a certain way. Uh, although that would be- Course I grain. Think, yeah, yeah, you can course grain. Yeah, but I don't think course graining is sufficient. I think it has to be um, averaged 
not just coarse grain because coarse grain simply means uh, unless um, unless maybe we, we mean different things but for me coarse grain simply means that you're taking your fractions to be larger right uh yes but i think you can sort of phrase averaging also in the but but anyway but uh, i mean i can have i can take sbs state and simply uh run the uh Run the mutual the, the accessible information uh, computation, and then average over all possible uh, over all possible partitions, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so this is this is something I can uh, I can always do. Yeah. So. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I I, I agree with you that um, the and your example, pardon, and your example looked like that. Yeah, your your example with the uh, GAZ state very very nice example actually mm -hmm. your example looked like that so we have uh, we have here uh, well okay this is a pure state okay but you can you can sort of imagine making it in a uh, uh, in a mixed state no yeah, yeah yeah totally I mean you can just trace out one of the GZ that, that states and then and your the, the states which you called R I J uh, they, they they would be two i i zero i i yeah. one and each state it will be this uh, uh, g eight z k yeah projector on g eight z k yeah but I think the issue here is that now of course here the computation was easy because okay there were symmetries and so on but in principle if you want to compute the averaged um, mutual information you will need to let's say unpack the individual g eight z states so you will need to unpack the individual R I J basically and allow them to mix among themselves. And I think this is, of course, this is what makes in general calculations of this sort of average mutual information incredibly demanding in a general context. And you can only do it um, either for very small systems or by taking advantage of, of some symmetries. Uh, but again, I think this makes the, so there, I, I fully agree that you can create a connection between SPS and consensus, but I think that from a technical point of view, it's not, it's not actually so simple. Well, I mean, as I said, I can, if I, if I have SBS, this has already a lot of, uh, a lot of symmetry. It's actually not classical quantum. It's even classical, classical state because of, with some noise, because of the orthogonality of the supports. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I can I can very easily calculate uh, not only accessible I can very easily calculate the quantum mutual informations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, as far as I understand the the suitability or not one of the approaches. Uh, so, so far I can see it like being more computational rather than fundamental. Oh no! Yeah, I agree. I agree. Fully. So okay. This is, it, it, okay. okay, Diana, very good. Okay, okay. Now the, the this this part is over. Okay, very good. Uh, now I have uh, because this is something I wanted to to understand. You know, because we we work very hard to to uh, construct this SBS state so that they have both redundancy and consensus. And then you read the paper which says that ah well yeah um, they have redundancy but consensus not so much <laughs> and we worked even harder for them to be non-disturbing but mm -hmm. that's the, the issue of non-disturbing we don't we, we don't touch here now uh, i have one question so uh, the sbs state uh, the sbs state that you that you showed it's not something that strictly follows from the jurex definition we needed an additional condition which we called uh, strong independence mm -hmm. in order uh, perhaps you can you can uh, bring back the slide where where the sbs state was defined it was somewhere um, earlier so i think the first definition was here. the first the first, the first yeah. oh yes 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 so there is this big uh, big tensor product okay and mm -hmm. uh, this big tensor product it's not strictly needed from the from the definition of objectivity if you yes. uh, uh, we have a work on that where where actually uh, it was actually marco piani that that noticed that that you can have uh, all the agreement among the measurements but not necessarily 
there has to be no correlations between the parts of the environment. So mm -hmm. what I'm trying to ask is that, did you look at this more general SBS structure that honestly we've never worked with because it's, it's so much more difficult? Um, yeah. <clears throat> have you worked on it from this perspective of uh, consensus and uh, redundancy? So, um, so we're actually aware of this, uh, let's say, um, other uh, definition of SPS. And uh, I would say that everything I've told you here uh, should be true, unless like very minor adjustments, uh, whether you use this definition with the big tensor product or whether you use uh, the one where you still allow some correlations, provided, of course, that whenever you do the partial traces, they're orthogonal, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so yeah, I would yeah say... exactly, exactly. That's that's what I'm talking about. Exactly that yeah. definition, where you have a big R uh, or a big R I for each I, uh, and when you make uh, all possible partial traces, then then they will be yes. the, the, um, the marginals will be orthogonal. Yes, uh, because so th I... this leaves the possibility to encode some correlations. So does it change the picture or not really? No, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I don't think it would change the picture. Okay. Um, okay. So I think that. Pretty much, so if, if, if I were to um, redo, let's say, the same presentation or the same calculations and I just use uh, this different SPS, everything I've told you so far should be exactly the same. Maybe you would need, again, to tweak some things a little bit just to, um, well, just to be consistent, but um, I don't think there's anything that would change. Okay, okay, and the last, uh, the last question, if I may. The most exciting thing about SBS was not so much their form, which from quantum information point of view is absolutely boring. It's a classical, classical state. There is nothing happening, mm -hmm. but that you find them in models. Yes, I agree. So uh, do you find, like, like uh, have you tried to look for the states, for example, the one with, with uh, G8Z or in general, have you tried to look at the uh, open quantum system models and uh, trying to find examples where redundancy would be, like you showed, much, much larger <coughs> and the consensus somehow created by nature, so to say? Um, so, uh, OK, uh, let's say I'll, I'll, I'll make two answers, two, two different answers to the same question. Uh, in the sense that, uh, okay, on the one hand, uh, we were mostly concerned with, uh, so for example, again, this GZ state, um, we were mostly concerned with finding something that was conceptually easy, uh, that would uh, be an example to this numerical difference. So we weren't so much interested in, um, let's say, looking at um, realistic models. However, there's two, um, there's two models that you can take into account that you, you, you could say they're a bit more realistic, um, where you would have this numerical difference. So the one, the first one is again uh, easy, uh, and it's basically this one. So again, um, you, you simply have um, information encoded it into a non-homogeneous way. So this model, what I think makes it realistic, is simply the fact that all you need to do is that you need to take your objective state. And you just need to enlarge your environment with an environmental fraction that has nothing to do with the system and with the correlated environment. Okay, which in my opinion feels realistic in the sense that um, I would expect that whenever you make a measurement, like in a realistic scenario, you may have to deal with um, you know systems. Well, not systems, but like constituents that are there, uh, but they didn't interact with anything else. And uh, of course, this will give you a numerical difference with redundancy and consensus. We have such, pardon, there are very easy uh, to imagine models of uh, of this type. Let's say quantum yeah, 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 yeah. model. You have one oscillator, a central oscillator, which couples to a family, to an environment of oscillators. If the frequencies of the environmental oscillators are far away from the resonance, so they are far away from the frequency of the central oscillator, uh, they will learn very little about uh, about the state of the central oscillator. How we worked around it, uh, I don't know how it relates to to, to your uh, nomenclature, but we simply then, in order to come closer to SBS, we had to enlarge the fraction. We had mm -hmm. we had to take a big, 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 big fraction because every 
each individual mode, like you said, was almost completely uncorrelated from the central state. Yes, so depending on the on the spectrum in the environment, the fraction sizes could be different in order to mm -hmm. to squeeze some information out of the state. Um, and the other thing I will mention, this is actually uh, also a paper we've done, but uh, many years ago. Um, so that it was again a paper about quantum Darwinism, uh, but it was much before, like much earlier than all these things about redundancy and consensus. Um, we were looking at uh, stochastic collision models. Uh, so basically uh, a situation where, okay, you have the standard collision models. I don't know how, like, I think you, some of you are familiar with it, but I don't know how much. Um, this is how we started spectrum broadcast structures. The, okay, the, collision, <laughs> the, collision, the collision model of uh, Jos and Zech uh, from 1985. It was the okay. first thing where we saw the SBS. And actually, that's why we started this uh, uh, strong independence. So breaking up the R state into, into a big tensor product, because in the collision model, photons do not interact. So, so mm -hmm. the, there was this uh, product structure in the environment. OK, OK. Uh, so yeah, there's basically just this. Uh, it, it's just an example, obviously. But like, um, so it's a situation where you would have this collision model, but the collisions are stochastic in the sense that they happen at random times. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you want to explain this randomicity from a quantum perspective, what you would need to do is to uh, introduce a super environment um, that would, again, explain the randomicity of the collision time. Um, and this would basically create a situation where you would, would have so the ancilla interacting with the system, and then another system, which we call the emitter, explaining like explaining the randomness, basically. Uh, and those two together, uh, they would actually be this sort of like um, situation where the information is encoded non-locally into the correlations between the ancilla and its own emitter. OK, so of course, this was, I wouldn't claim this is actually a realistic model in a certain way, but it's, um, it's a model of quantum Darwinism that we studied. Um, and yes, you, you do need, uh, like, if you, if you treat them, um, so if, if you do these sort of things, you, you will have, again, a numerical difference between redundancy and consensus. You would actually have something that kind of looks like the GZ state I just mentioned you uh, previously. Yeah, you will have that, 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 that structure. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, interesting. All, uh, the, the, there has been a bit of movement recently to study Darwinism in, in structured environments, uh, although it's, mm -hmm. quite, uh, it's, quite, uh, it's quite difficult, but uh, I think I think your, your work is like a step in that direction, like showing that in structured environments you can have you can have this discrepancy between redundancy and, and, and consensus. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. Okay. Okay. It would be it would be interesting to see more uh, realistic models somehow studied. There were there, there were studies of uh, uh, spin chains, like each environment yeah. structured uh, as a, as a spin chain. Uh, we wanted we wanted to take a look if, if there is SBS propagation. It's maybe a plan for the future. If 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 there is some sort of like an onion structure and an SBS state is propagating from the first layer to the next layer and so on, mm -hmm. perhaps uh, losing fidelity. Uh, look at the time scales. Uh, potentially interesting. Diana, thank you very much. Uh, one last question: uh, Whom are you working with in in Belfast? With uh, Mauro or? Yeah, yeah, with Mauro. With Mauro Paternoster. Okay, okay, very good. Okay, okay I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Yarek, for all the questions. Thank you, Jana, also. It was a very nice uh, seminar, and also it was a pleasure to have you. I think we can finish for today because we pass uh, a lot from the time. And if everybody else wants uh, to make questions, they can send an email to you. Uh, we can finish for today. And uh, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. See you next week. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.